to study God's Word this morning in the format of a Sabbath school class. Yeah. I enjoyed the songs that we sang this morning. I like the first one. Great is thy faithfulness. And the next two I also enjoy. 428 and 429. I see no visitors, so there's no point in welcoming the visitors. Except myself, I'm a visitor. It's good to see all of you. Hope you all had a blessed week. Growing in your relationship with Christ. This quarter we're studying the book of Galatians. Last Sabbath we concluded our study by looking at uh, Galatians chapter 5 verses 13 and 14. And what we're doing this quarter is we're studying the book of Galatians exactly like God inspired the Apostle Paul to record it. We're looking at paragraphs, we're looking at sections, we're looking at phrases, we're looking at specific words that God inspired the Apostle Paul to choose in order to express the inspired thought that God gave Paul. It is crucial that we understand that these words are the words of the inspired writer, but the thought is inspired by whom? God. The last section that we studied last Sabbath was Galatians 5, 13, and 14. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but through love serve one another. For all the scriptures fulfilled in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as whom? As we love ourselves. What freedom is Paul talking about here? Is he talking about freedom from political bondage or military imprisonment? Is that what he's talking about? Yes. And learn, we learned in Galatians 3.22 that the scripture, the scriptures have confined everything, all human beings, under the sin issue. The word sin here is not talking about the verb, our action, just talking about our condition, our sinful condition. We are born with a terminal disease called the sinful nature. Thank you. You're welcome. In modern English, we call that imprisonment. Uh, that bondage being debtors to the law. We are debtors to God's law. But we just read in verse 13, for we have been called into liberty. What kind of liberty have we been called into? Wow. To free us from the sin problem. Amen. Not to free us to sin, the verb, but to save us and free us from the sin problem and until that is solved in a generation of people Jesus cannot come back what did we just sing here in uh, Sam 249 praise him praise him the last stanza says Christ is coming over the world, what? Victorious. Victorious. He cannot come back until he has a people that have allowed him to make them victorious over what? Sin. The sin condition. <coughs> Do you understand that? Amen. <laughs> it doesn't matter how many earthquakes we have. I, mean, I, I, I grew up in California. I thought that California was the only place that had earthquakes. I'll find out even Florida has earthquakes. And tornadoes and hurricanes. And the contamination in the air and the pollution in the water. Are those bad things? 
Yes. But is that going to trigger Jesus' second coming? No. Not according to Scripture? When does Scripture say Jesus is coming back? Right. What do we learn from when someone asks me, well, when is Jesus coming back? And I say, well, when the second half of the third seal is fulfilled. I say, what? What are you talking about? The second half of the third seal? The sixth seal? And so I ask him, does your Bible include Revelation chapter 6? Well, of course it does. Now, why don't you look up verses 12 and 13? And they read it to me. They talk about the signs that Jesus talked about in Matthew 24, when his disciples asked him, when are you coming back? And he answers the question. And he said, when you see these signs in nature, then you know that what? The general time frame is very, very close. And so that's what Revelation 6, 12, and 13 is talking about. And then I ask him, has verse 14 through 17 of Revelation 6 been fulfilled? Not yet. And that's the correct answer, not yet. So what is the question? What question should follow that? Not yet. <coughs> well, when is it going to be fulfilled? And you need to read Revelation 7, 1, 2, and 3. And Revelation 7, 3 says what? Till what? God has a people that have allowed him to what? Seal them where? On the forehead. And what does that symbolically mean? Sealing them on their forehead. The mind. What? The mind. Yes. Symbolically the mind. God has a people that have decided up here, because this is the decision-making process, right? We have a sinful nature. And Jesus came to conquer what? The sinful nature. Now you and I have a choice. When we get up in the morning, do we have choices? Do we have a choice whether we're going to be grumpy towards our spouse or towards our pets or towards our children? Do we have a choice in that? Of course. That's where Jesus came to free us from. The sinful nature. Many sincere Christians forget that the transgression of the law is sin because we yield the nature over to whom? Satan. To Satan. That's the problem. What's the as positive aspect of Galatians 5, 13 and 14? The greatest Happiness and freedom in life is serving others. <coughs> and when this is motivated by love, what's fulfilled? The law is fulfilled. That's what verse 14 of Galatians 5 says. So true happiness is not found in us making ourselves happy or seeking for personal happiness, but making others happy. Yes, that's biblical. We also touched very briefly on love. Does love ever cease? That is the love of God. Don't we learn from 1 John 4, 8 that God is love? It's not talking about one of God's characteristics. It's talking about what God is. God is love. So it's impossible for God's love to ever cease. It's impossible. So how do we define true love? Love is the quality within a person that loves someone else in spite of the circumstances or the character of the someone else. That is love. Love is not restricted by circumstances. If it were, we would all be lost. What does Romans 5, 6 say? When I was helpless and ungodly, what did Jesus do? 
He came and died for me. Romans 5, 8. When I was a sinner, what did Jesus do? He came and died for me. Romans 5, 10. When I was his declared enemy, at enmity with him, what did he do? He came and died for me. That is the issue. Happiness, you will never experience the happiness that God wants for you to experience on this earth unless you are focused on letting His agape love indwell you. In you and then through you. That's biblical. It is amazing to me the number of people that claim to be Christians and understand the Bible or claim to understand the Bible and do not understand that happiness comes from experiencing the love of God which is set out outwards, always away from us. Do we understand that? It's not natural for us. The highest conception of human love is to love someone else because what? Love you back. Back to the hymnal. Oh, how I love Jesus because he first loved what? Me. That's the best we can do. That's the best that we can hope for on this earth. Unless we identify with his mission when he was here and his mission now. What is his mission now? To prepare his people. It's in the second part. Instead of focusing on me seeking happiness, he wants me to look around and see who I can make happy. Can I make people happy by allowing Christ to reproduce his character in me? Amen. Do you notice the multi billionaires that have become multi billionaires <coughs> because they found an idea? or a service that everyone can benefit from? That's what Amazon is all about. It's marketing ideas and products. And now they've bought Whole Foods. I found out last week that Whole Foods now has little cages, little uh, compartments that they're renting out. And you can order stuff from all over the world and send it to Whole Foods to your little locker, your little cage, and they'll put it in there until you get good and ready to come over and pick it up. That is genius. Wow. Wow. They're going to monopolize the marketing system. That's what Jesus is trying to do, looking for a generation that will say, wow, these people have allowed Christ to reproduce his character. They are not focused on being happy themselves. They're focused on proclaiming what? What we're studying here right now. Liberty. Liberty from what? From the sin condition. In the chaos that we live today, do you think that God will be able to draw people's attention to a people that are focused on what Jesus was focused on when he was on this earth? Yes, he will. People say, I can't figure out how to witness. Are you kidding me? If you allow Christ to reproduce his character in you, the world will be the path to you. Knock your door down. I want what you have. How did you get this? How are you experiencing this? <clears throat> the highest human conception of love is to <clears throat> love someone because they love you or because they are very lovable. That is 100% eros and phileo love, brotherly love. 
But God loves me, the ungodly. God even loves those that hate him. What? Let's turn in our Bibles. Let's go to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. When you get there, say, ready? Do I have a volunteer to read Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 7? Okay, Mary Jane, thank you. Everybody there? Titus chapter 3, it's a very small little book toward the end of the New Testament. Chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Thank you. You like that? Thank you. That we may become heirs of what? For eternal life. But before we can become heirs for eternal life, we have to become compatible with the atmosphere of heaven. The atmosphere of heaven is not focused on self. The atmosphere of heaven is focused on others, <coughs> making others happy. Now, any questions on our review of what we did last week? Any questions at all? Okay? Let's begin our study for this week by turning to Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to finish Galatians chapter 5, and we're going to begin with verses 15, 16, 16 17, and 18. Galatians chapter 5, these four verses uh, present a profound landmark truth. <coughs> Who would like to volunteer to read verses 15 through 18 of Galatians chapter 5? <clears throat> Novelette. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Thank you. By allowing themselves <coughs> to be influenced by unbiblical traditions, the Galatian converts were bringing themselves under the curse of the law. And in so doing, preparing themselves to lose their souls. And this departure from what the Apostle Paul had taught them brought about what? Bickering, devouring one another, biting one another. Dissension and strife are the tattoos of departing from the faith. And you exhibit them every, constantly. That's what tattoos do. People put tattoos because they what? What are, what are they saying? Unconsciously, what are they saying? I don't like the way God created me, so yeah. I want to adorn myself, yeah. because I want, what? Attention. That's, that's self, that's the way all of us are. Some of us have tattoos, some others are just that way. Let's take a close look at verses 16 and 17. In the Greek language of the New Testament, 
they frequently gave you the end of a story before they gave you the beginning. This is a very good example of that style of writing. I preached a sermon once, and included Galatians 5, 16 and 17. After the service, a very dignified gentleman coming out greeted me and said, May I speak to you after you get through greeting everyone? I said, Sure. So he went and sat down in the vestibule. And afterwards, I came over and I met him and he introduced himself as a former retired pastor and Bible instructor. And I said, uh oh. <laughs> I'm in trouble. He said, I want to thank you for the remarks that you made today, but I think it's important for us, very tactful, for us to always remember to be positive in what we present to people. Because generally people are trying to do what is right. And I said, really? And he said, we want to encourage people that even though they continue to fail in doing what is right, we still want to continue, con we want to encourage them to continue to do what is right. Well, I knew right away what he was saying, what he was talking to me about. And I said to him, do you still have your Greek Bible in your library? He said, of course. Would you do me a favor? Of course. Would you look up Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, and after taking a look at it, tell me what it is that the Apostle Paul says that I will not be able to do. Here's my phone number. Give me a call back. I didn't hear from him for about 10, 11 days. And when I heard from him, I wasn't there, so he left the message. And the message was, please continue to present Galatians 5, 17, and 16 as you did a couple of Sabbaths ago. Now, why do you think he said that? If you and I were writing Galatians 5, 16, and 17 in the English language, we would write verse 17 first, and then we would write verse 16. So, let's read it as we would write it in English. Ready? I'm going to read it to you. The flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are in opposition to another. That's a nice word. These are at war with each other. So that you may not do the things that you please. That's the fact. What is the solution? Verse 16, I say then, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. And that is what Paul is saying in verse 17. You will not be able to do the things that you please. What are the things that my sinful nature pleases to do? Everything that is bad, illegal, and in my case, fattening. <laughs> That's the way I wake up every morning. That is what the Apostle Paul is saying here. He says something similar to the Romans in Romans 8.4. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Same concept. Any questions on this? The flesh and the spirit have nothing in common with each other. They are opposed to each other. And they are looking for every opportunity to destroy the other one. You and I decide who's going to win. Good job. Pardon? Good job. But it's really, what is our job? To submit. To, to conquer the, what? Submit to the will of God. Yes. Has Jesus conquered the flesh? Yes. 
What does Jesus tell me to do in Romans in Revelation 3.21? Chuck, I want for you to overcome the way that I overcame. Now, if Jesus did not identify with me at the Incarnation, what do we have to do with Revelation 3.21? We have to white it out of our Bibles. Because that makes Jesus the biggest hypocrite that ever walked on this earth. To ask me to overcome as he overcame, but he overcame with different equipment than I have to overcome with? So whenever you hear anyone say that we're going to continue to sin until we come back, when Jesus comes back, is that biblical? No. So yes, the job is big, but what is the job? The job is for me to say no to what? Yes. That's our choice. Has a victory been achieved over the sinful human nature yes, yes. Jesus in the last 6,000 years? Yes? It's your choice and my choice as to whether we choose to experience that victory. That's what the book of Galatians is all about. That's your choice and my choice. Question? I heard a voice. Well, it's just me. I just spec it loud. What is the question? I mean, okay. Sorry. It's okay. In verse 18, we have a similar thought than what Paul expressed in Romans 6.14. So I'll read it very briefly, verse 18, and then I want for you to turn to Romans 6.14 as I'm reading verse 18 again which Navalette read for us. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. What is the expression, led by the Spirit? If I'm being led by the Spirit, who is, who, who is doing the leading? This is a parable. She's the Holy Spirit, and I'm a human being. Who's leading whom? Am I leading her? No. Me, the human being, leading the Holy Spirit? She's People pray control. for the Holy Spirit so that they can do what they want to do. She's in control. But what, is, what, what did I just read there? She, the Holy Spirit, is leading me. What do I do? Well, I put my hand out there, and what is... Ah, there you have it. And the physical or the visual aspect of me putting my hand out there is what? Turning the faith of Jesus that I've been given a measure of over to the Holy Spirit, and now the Holy Spirit says, that's all I've been waiting for. Do we understand that? I mean, this is the recipe. This is the way it works. That, that's what we're reading here. It's crucial that we understand this. Because if you woke up this morning, and you obviously did, you're here. The moment you wake up, you're dealing with what? Decisions, experiences, and temptations. At least, that's what I'm dealing with from the time that I open up my eyes. And I'm aware that I'm awake. We all have agendas, we all have schedules, right? Is it our privilege to turn these agendas and schedules over, over to Christ? Yeah. In Psalms, I don't know which one it is, 45, 54, Jesus, the psalmist says that God woke Jesus up every morning. Isn't that beautiful? It's nice. And he explained to him, this is your agenda today. Sometimes the Holy Spirit told Jesus what the agenda would be the next day. And what did Jesus do? He spent the whole night in prayer getting ready for the next day's activities. Okay, what does Romans 6.14 say? Who would like to read that for us? Lois. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Thank you. Most people just quote the last part. Oh, we're saved by grace and not by law. Yeah, why? What does the first part of the verse say? Sin shall not have a dominion. Right. And when does sin have no dominion over me? Walking in the Spirit. When I'm walking in the Spirit, I turn myself over to whom? To the Holy Spirit. It's impossible for the 
Satan to have or sin to have dominion over us. It is impossible. Do we understand that? Is that good advice or good news? Aren't you fed up with good advice? <laughs> huh? You should do this. You ought to do this. You must do this. All old covenant. Does the Holy Spirit know what it's wanting, what it wants to do in us?